right. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Welcome to our virtual Sunday school lesson. I'm Pastor LaShawn Rutherford, and I'll be your teacher or your presenter today. As always, we greet you from the New Bethel Church at 745 Walker Avenue in Kansas City, Kansas, under the awesome leadership of our senior pastor, Bishop A. Glenn and Lady Angela Brady. Listen, I'm happy you are joining us today. Uh, but before we dive in, I want you to consider sharing this to your social media. Uh, you know, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever is out there, I want you to share this session because it is uh, you and I responsibility. We have a responsibility to uh, spread this great gospel of Jesus Christ. And during these times, the best way to do that, it's not only during the, during the life that you live, but sharing sessions like this, that can be a blessing to someone. And I know that uh, it's kind of hard nowadays to really be interactive and all of that good stuff when you're on uh, online, but I want you to interact with us today. I want you to comment in the comment section, ask questions in the comment section, reply to one another in the comment sections. And even if you have questions, put it out there. We want to be able to come back and read those and answer questions uh, so that we can stay connected. And if there was ever a time for us to stay connected, days like this, these days, we need to stay as connected as we possibly can. So today's lesson is titled, Loving by Serving. Loving by Serving. And I want to add a little something to that. So we have Loving by Serving, but I want to add a little subtopic to concentrate on. And I want you to consider called to wait. Called to wait. I want you to remember that. So again, the title of this lesson is Loving by Serving, but I want to consider that subtopic, Call to Wait. So let's look at our scripture reference this morning, our focal verses. They're found in the book of the beloved disciple, John. John, let's look at St. John, chapter number 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 15, and then we're going to skip down to verses 34 and 35. Uh, I'm reading that in the, the uh, New King James Version, so you can read along there or in your uh, whatever version you may have, but come on, let's read. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse number two says, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <laughs> you know how Peter was. Jesus answered and said unto him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse number 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is the key right here. He says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, by this, this right here, that's how you know what a Christian is, what Christianity look like. You wanna know a follower of Jesus Christ? You will know it by the love they have for one another. So what about what are our objectives today for our lesson? Uh, number one, our first objective is to define biblical love. What is biblical love? And secondly, we want to understand what it is to be a servant or to have servitude and to serve. We want to get an understanding there. And we also want to have some life applications. How do we apply this lesson to our daily life? So as we go through this lesson this morning, I want you to consider those objectives, okay? So what is love? Love. I always say love is kind of difficult to explain. Uh, and I'm sure if we went around a classroom setting and ask everybody what love is, everybody would have a different perspective on love because we explain things through our experiences. Well, Webster has two entries for the word of love. One entry has nine definitions and another entry has four. So when I pull all of that together, Webster says that love is something that you hold dear or you cherish or something you take pleasure in. Uh, he also says that love is a strong affection for one another, whether that's kinship or friendship, or personal ties, or even a strong attraction. That's what Webster says love is. But what is love from a biblical standpoint? What is love? When we look at it in the Greek, there are four words um, that explain what love is. And when you're reading the Bible, you have to read it, read it in lieu of what these definitions of love is. So let's look at the Greek. Storgi. Storgi relates to a fondness. I love that. You know, that I love this, I love going to the theater, you know, stuff like that. That's, that's related to a fondness. Or then the second word used in the Greek is eros. Eros is that romantic type of love, love between husband and wife. And then there's filio or phileo. Uh, that word is more of a non-sexual type of love. Uh, non non sexual type of affection. You love your children. You love your friends. You know that type of love. And then there's the age old agape. Agape is what I call a god like love because it is um, no strings attached. It's selfless. It's a selfless commitment to another, and it's pure and willful and sacrificial. That's that God kind of love. It's a sacrificial type of love, agape. So in lieu of those definitions, when you're reading this scripture, you have to know what that word love is relating to. And a lot of time it is agape when it's talking about the type of love that Jesus has and what he's requiring of us as Christian. So Christianity is built, its foundation is built on love. Christianity's whole foundation is built on love. And um, a lot of people say that uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection, that's the foundation of Christianity, especially the resurre resurrection. Uh, but why did he do it? Why did God wrap himself in flesh, come down as the only begotten of the Father, dwell among us uh, as the Son? Why did he do that? to die, to be buried, to raise again. Uh, he did all of that because of love. The scripture even goes on to say in 1 John uh, 4, I think it's verses seven through eight, uh, it says, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
Love is so important that in our lesson in verses 34 and 35, he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. You wanna know uh, how people recognize a real Christian and you wanna know how to recognize if you're a real Christian, then it's gonna be recognizable through the love that you have. That's what Jesus said, the love that you have for one another, not how much you shout or run or get excited, not how much you love gospel music and Christian worship and all of that. That is not the mark of a, a Christian. That's things we do. But the true, true mark of a real Christian, Christian means to be Christ-like, is to imitate his love his love for one another. That word in there is agapeano. Oh, not, I said agapeano, agapano. Nah, let me correct that. Agapeo, A-G-A-P-A-O, agapeo. When I looked up that word, that word is the verb form of love. So in that scripture, a verb means action. So that means that uh, love is not merely an emotion or something that you feel a warm on the inside, but love and it's in action, it's something that you do. So when the lesson says loving by, by serving, it's saying, show me your love by what you do through your actions. And when I was looking at the lesson, it reminded me so much of the book, uh, The Five Love Languages. And the premise of that whole book is centered around the fact that uh, we speak in five different love languages. We speak that way, we, we receive love in those different five love languages. And where the conflict comes in is when you're trying to show love in a way that I don't understand. So it, it, it gives us five of them. What are those five love languages? There's words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. And though my wife and I, you know, we try our hardest to be bilingual when it comes to love and speak each other's languages, as well as receive in our own way, we try to be bilingual, but I can tell you for sure uh, what my wife's primary love language is. Uh, it's not gifts, she enjoys gifts, um, it's not acts of service, uh, but it's definitely words of affirmation. She is, she receives love and understands it better through words of affirmation and, and physical touch. So she does that as well. Um, but that's, that's how she receives love. So when I want to show her that I really love her, it's through those words of affirmation. Now, me, on the other hand, I don't have to have a gift. I don't have to have words of, of affirmation, uh, quality time. Yes, I love quality time, all of those types of stuff, but, but mine, I love physical touch too. But um, the primary way that I speak in love is through um, acts of service. So I grew up in a home where you had to show you love you know, show me you love, you can say and give me gifts and all of that stuff, but your actions speak way far louder than your words. I want to know what you're doing. Show me that you love me, acts of service. And to be honest with you, I think Jesus speaks in all of those different love languages, but one important one is acts of service, loving by serving. So what is it to serve? In the text of the lesson, we find, of course, that Jesus is saying, I can show you better than I can tell you what it is to serve. So if you look at what's going on, it's before the feast of the Passover, but it's not the Passover feast, not in this particular scripture in John. Uh, it clearly says that it's before the Passover feast, because in Jewish tradition, uh, they celebrate the Passover for about a week a week or eight days, somewhere around that time, they celebrate the week of the Passover. And it's a celebration and, and they have the also the traditional Passover feast. So according to John, of course, this is before. So I don't want us to get mixed up in our beliefs. John says it is before. 
Uh, it's his last supper with those that he loved. It was no different um, than just any other family dinner when you look at it that way, uh, like we do today, a Sunday dinner. <laughs> it's the same thing where everyone has sat down to eat and afterwards, uh, some people are still sitting around the table. They're having a conversation. They're talking and they're talking about who has the highest rank in the kingdom. Which one of them? This is the disciples. Which one of them has the highest rank in the kingdom? You'll, you'll find that it's not in John, but if you look at the account in Luke's uh, gospel, in chapter number 22, you will see that they were they were talking about who has the who's gonna have the highest rank in, in Jesus's kingdom. And Jesus says, let he that is greatest, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he who serves. So what is he saying? That uh the greatest among you should be a servant. That's what he's saying. Out of the blue, after he says that, he takes off his outer robe or his outer garment, wraps a towel around himself, and begins to wash their feet. Now, I want you to recognize that the removing of Jesus's garment, when he removes his outer robe or his garment, that represents the removal of his glory the removal of that kingship or his crown, if you'll allow me to say it that way, it's the removal of his crown. It, it, it represents that, that thing that demands a certain treatment. You ever met, met people that um, without them even saying it, uh, they, were, they had that persona, that aura about themselves that says, uh, I'm the king, I deserve honor, respect me. I'm the leader, respect me. But Jesus says, you know, and you know, it's some millionaires like that too. He doesn't have that millionaire complex that says my money demands me respect or my title demands me respect from you. Um, so when again, when he takes that off, it represents him taking off that kingship, all that glory takes it off, takes off that crown and instead of him saying, I deserve your respect, he takes the crown off and puts on a servant's apron. Yeah, and that's just the way that I describe it. That towel, you know, it reminds me of putting on an apron because uh, you're about to serve. If you look at the scripture in Philippians 2, verse 7 through 8, 7 through 8, it says, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. All God, this is Jesus. He's all God. He's all man. He's all powerful. He has creation in his mouth. Let there be and there is. That's the same Godness, the same Jesus who takes all of this off, wraps a towel around his waist, bends down and begins to serve by washing the disciples' feet. Now, I'm sure when you're reading this, this story, you can tell just by reading it that it caught the disciples by surprise. It caught them off guard because they would have, of course, washed their feet before they even came into the house. Before they came into the house, uh, normal tradition said that the owner of the house would set a basin there at the front door. And when visitors came in, they would wash their feet because you know they traveled by feet. There were no cars back then, so they traveled by feet, by horse. It was a lot of sand, so it was just customary to wash your feet off when you go into someone's home. Um, and if you didn't wash your feet, it was more of a sign of you're, you're in mourning. And if you were of a certain class, uh, I don't want to say the upper echelon, but if you were of a certain class of people, you had a little wealth there, and you had people working for you. Um, they would have the servant, the servant to wash your feet. They would have somebody at the front door. When you came into the front door, the servant would kneel down and they would wash your feet. Now, this wasn't just 
any old servant or any old slave. It was the lowest on the totem pole. So not just any servant, but the lowest servant, the lowest of the low. That's why Peter said, oh, no, 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 no. You will not wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't, you'll have no part with me. You'll have no part with me. He said, you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will later. This is what gets me. Because it's one thing to wash the feet of somebody you respect, that you know, that you love. It's one thing to wash their feet, but it's a whole nother thing to wash the feet of someone when the Bible says, and he knew. He knew. He knew that uh, he was about to wash the feet of Judas, somebody who would betray him. He knew. He knew that he was going to wash Peter's feet, who, who uh, would go on to deny him, turn his back on him. And he knew he was washing the feet of people who would, soon as he's gone, soon as he is hung on the cross and is put in a tomb, they would go back to their normal norm of doing whatever they were doing before they even met Jesus. <laughs> is this, this clicking a little bit in there? He knew but yet and still, he still washed their feet. The love that he had for them, he was showing them that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to be a servant. You wanna know how to be a servant? Serve and wash the feet of those that, <laughs> that even may deny you. Now, see, that gets me. That really hits home for me because I can come to church and wash the feet of somebody that I love, but somebody I'm having a problem with, somebody that uh, I may not respect. They may live a different lifestyle to me. And the way it hit me is that Jesus is still washing my feet today. He's still serving me today. So, my feet are still dirty. And I read in, in a context and when I was studying that the dirt on your feet represented sin. It represented not being in right standing. Uh, it represented because you'll notice that Jesus said, you're clean, except for your feet. Your feet aren't clean. Where you've been ain't clean. And sometimes if you be honest with yourself, Yes, we are baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, but yet sometimes we find ourselves in unclean situations. Sometimes the way we respond to people is unclean. Sometimes our attitude is unclean. Sometimes our desires are, are not clean. Jesus is still washing your feet today. And I want you to understand that because he does that and then he turns around and tells them what I'm doing. I want you to do. If I, being your teacher and your Lord, can lower myself, take off my crown, take off my glory, and I can wash your feet and I can serve you, I can be a servant, I can, in other words, I can wait on you. Scripture says, they that wait on the Lord. And the reason I put that as a subtopic is because that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is waiting on the disciples on the disciples he's not waiting on them uh, as in looking at his clock waiting on something to happen but he has taken the role of a uh, a waiter look at it like that as a waiter he's come to the table and he's got his his pad what can i do for you what do you want and i wonder what would happen if we today people today took on the aspect of waiting on God. They that wait on him. Jesus, may I take your order, please? What do you want, Jesus? My, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about you. What do you want? And you know God is all about his people. He's all about serving his people from the highest to the lowest, from the ones that look like they ought to be served and the ones that don't look like they ought to be served, from the ones that he loves that may not live like you live. But we as Christians are still required to serve, to serve them. How do you show that type of love to someone? You show it by serving them. 
That's why I say Jesus' primary love language, I don't want to say primary, but one of his main love languages was that of a servant. And he says, if you want to know the mark of a true Christian, it's in how they love by serving. But it goes beyond an act because you can go through the motions of, 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 of all of that, but your heart can be far from it. So love is a heart condition. It's, it's you got to ask God for a change of heart. Love is a heart type of thing. And if you're going to serve, you can't serve just by going through the motions. That doesn't get it. You have to serve with the heart of a servant. I really want to please God in what I do. I'm not just going through the motions. I may start out going through the motions and God may have to fix my heart along the way. But whatever you got to do, to put your mind frame in that of a servant, that is what God is saying. You know, they always say, uh, you know, I hear people all the time in this time saying, uh, God and country, love your country, love all, all of these things. But I wonder what would happen if we really, really served one another through loving. I wonder what would happen if Democrats and Republicans really, really served one another. I wonder what would happen if CEOs served employees and what would happen if managers served subordinates and leaders served subordinates and they took off their crowns, their crowns that say, I'm the boss, I'm the CEO, I'm the one that deserves the respect. You know, <laughs> what would happen if they took that crown off and said, no, 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 I'm going to take Jesus's example and I can show you love better than I can tell you I love you. I can show you I love you by how I serve you. How I serve you. That's the whole basis of today's lesson. Loving by serving. So if you look at the objectives, we have defined the biblical definition of love. We have looked at what it means to be a servant. Take your path, lower yourself, take off your crown. God, how can I help you today? <laughs> Woo, that is so good. And we've also looked at how we can apply that to our own personal lives, just being in the country that we live in. Um, we can apply that at work so that we don't look at ourselves as so much deserving, but how can I serve? And it's one thing, like I mentioned before, to serve people that you deem deserve that. But can you serve someone who doesn't look like you, act like you, doesn't live the lifestyle that you live, uh, that it kind of grinds your gears a little bit to serve? Can you respond the way Jesus did and say, even though you're going to deny me, I know you don't like me, but. I'm going to wash your feet. That's the lesson for today. Love, loving by serving. Share this because the world needs to know. What the world needs now is a little bit more love. God bless you. God keep you. Amen.